So before we start this activity, make sure that you have in front of you this blank water cycle diagram, uh, either in Canvas or printed out, um, in, and you're gonna do it with your own pens and you can put this in your notes. But this is gonna save you a lot of time. There's gonna be a lot of stuff we're gonna put on here. So yes, you could get this out of the book, but it's just gonna be a lot of faster if we draw this diagram together and I can explain things as I go along. So this is a drawing. I think you can kind of understand what's going on here. This is kind of a cross-sectional view. So we're not looking up, we're looking straight out. So the sky is up here. This is the ground, okay? Um, you can see this is kind of a valley here. At the very bottom of the valley is a river. So this is where the river is, right in there. There's some trees, we go up here. This is a lake. Um, and then everything underneath this is the ground, underground. So this is all underground. So we're gonna show that, um, we'll talk about this. This is actually impervious rock. And then this is um, gravel or sand. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So the first thing we're gonna put on here real quickly is we're gonna put some water cycle vocabulary on here. I know this is review, but um, it's important. So this is, can't see it very well, that's my little cloud. And so when it rains, we call that precipitation. And I'm gonna circle these water cycle words. And when it hits the ground, it can run off the ground. That's just water that's running off the top of the ground. So we're gonna call that runoff. Um, if it doesn't run off, it will go into the ground, all right? And we're going to call that infiltration. So if it doesn't, whatever doesn't run off gets sucked into the ground, that's infiltration. Okay, so we'll then let's go on with on the other side here. When we have water in a lake and the sun hits it, it's going to evaporate. So let's write that. This is evaporation. That is liquid water going to gaseous water. So gaseous water, you cannot see. Gaseous water is always invisible. Um, it's water vapor, right? So if we're gonna put it into a cloud, you can see a cloud. So a cloud cannot be water vapor. A cloud is either ice, solid water, or it's most likely liquid water. So to go from a gas to a liquid, we call that condensation. And we're gonna learn more about that later. And those are the words that we probably remember, although there's one more arrow here. This arrow going from the tree, this is a kind of evaporation. And in this class, that's gonna be very important. This is water that the tree grabs from the roots, brings up the tree, and evaporates it through the leaves. This is called transpiration. Not an insignificant quality, we'll find out. So those are the basic water cycle vocabulary words. So the next thing we wanna add here, because that's just the water cycle vocabulary, we wanna add surface water. Surface water is water on the surface. Well, where do we find surface water? We find it in the streams, right? So this is a little, this is a little river right here, okay? Um, and and um, the river is down in here, but when there's a lot of water and the river floods, it's gonna come out of its bank and it's going to fill in this whole area here. Okay, so where's the river? Is the river here or is it here? Well, it's both. So this is what we're gonna call right here. We're gonna call this the low flow channel. That's where water is, it's restricted to that little low flow channel between flood events. But if there's a lot of water coming down, it's gonna go over its banks and we're gonna see this happening. And, and this is called the floodplain. So from here all the way to here, this is the flood plain. That's, that's, this area is the place where you can find the river at some point, all right? And then we also have the lake up here, right? So there's water in the lake. So the water in the lake, the water uh, in the floodplain or in the river, those are the surface water. So some of the qualities of surface water, um, it's, it's really easy to use. Now you might wanna put these in your notes. Surface water is easy to use because it's right there. It's the first water you're gonna get, um, but it's also easily polluted. So where else is there water? Well, if all this is surface water, there's also groundwater, right? 
So groundwater, where is the groundwater? Well, groundwater is in the ground, and how does it get there? Groundwater has to get in there through infiltration. So what does that mean? It just means that water is slipping through the little cracks between pebbles and, and until it, it's, it's just going to go down until it gets to solid rock. So this, these darker areas down here, this is impervious rock. So let's write that in here. I had to find a better pen. This is impervious rock, right? So this is impervious rock. All of this is impervious rock. Impervious means that water cannot go through it. So when water is going through this ground here, which obviously it can go through, it's going to stop here. And it's going to still go down. It's going to go down on top of this. And it's just going to start piling up underground, not in a big cavern, but just in between all the nooks and crannies. All right. And as it gets higher and higher and higher while it's underground, this very top part of where the water is and where the water isn't, we're going to call that the water table. The water table is the top of this aquifer. This is called an unconfined aquifer. An unconfined aquifer is unconfined. It has a definite bottom, but it doesn't have a definite top because this can fluctuate going up or down. But let's make sure we understand what this actually means. We're going to take a little section of this and we're going to blow it up to make it look big. All right, and we're going to take a little section of this and we're going to blow it up to make it look big. All right, so this is just sort of a, 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 a magnification of this little spot. And what we're going to see is this is just a bunch of pieces of rock. Now, this could be sand. It could be gravel. It's just pieces of rock. And this is underground, too. Same thing. This is just pieces of rock. These could be, this could be actual size. This could be microscopic. It doesn't matter. But it's little pieces of rock. So what's the difference between this rock that's right here and this rock that's right here? Well, the spaces in between the pebbles in here are filled with water. So we're just going to color in all the spaces between those little pebbles. All right. So we call this, this has a special name. The name of this is the zone of saturation, right? This here, all of this, this whole area actually is the zone of saturation. It's where the rock, between the, the rocks, between all the little pebbles, it's saturated with water. It's just completely filled with water. So what about this area here? What's in between the rock pieces there? It's just air. So we call this the zone of aeration. So those are fancy terms. The zone of aeration is just rock that's air in between them. And here it's just rock with water in between them. But we got to get understand that an aquifer is not an underground cavern filled with water. It's just, it could be sand or gravel. It's just in between the little pieces of sand and gravel, the water is filling the space. So we call that the zone of saturation. So this zone of saturation is this entire unconfined aquifer, all right, unconfined. And any place the water lands here, it's going to go through the ground and down into this unconfined aquifer. But it can't get below it because it's got this impervious rock. How is water going to get into this band of sand? Well, if the water falls right there, right, it falls between this spot and this spot, it's going to make it in that area, right? And so we're going to call this the recharge zone. Okay, so that's a recharge zone. This little spot right here is the recharge zone for this aquifer. So water is going to just trickle into here, and it's going to go down, down, down. It's going to keep on going down. It's going to fill up this entire spot. Well, it's going to take a long time because the recharge zone is very small. But you see, this does have a confined top. 
and a confined bottom. So we're going to call this the confined aqua, oops, aquifer. That's the confined aquifer because it has a top and a bottom, right? And that's going to be a lot cleaner than, than the unconfined aquifer because pollution and things that can't get in through there, the only place that anything can get in there is right here. So obviously if you spilled some stuff there, it would get in the unconfined aquifer. So we got our, our, our confined aquifer. We got our unconfined aquifer that's in the top, sitting on top of this impervious layer. We've got this confined aquifer between these two impervious layers. There's a layer way down here which doesn't look like it's connected to anything. Is that possible? Because there's water down there. We're going to call this the very old aquifer. How did the water get there? Well, it might be so old that these zones of these recharge zones might have geologically just disappeared, or or maybe they're so far away. Um, that they're not even on this map. But either way, this is very, very old water. This is not being recharged at all anymore. Um, it could be a lot of water. Some old aquifers are so old, maybe that's from old seawater that was down there, and this is from an old ocean. So a lot of this uh, really uh, deep water is salt water. But there's a lot of old aquifers that might be just tens of thousands of years old, um, but that are not being charged very much at all. These are important to understand because this water, there's, these might be very large, and this is going to be the cleanest water. I mean, boy, this water is beautiful water. This water is pretty good, um, and this water is the easiest to get to, but it could be polluted. All right? So how are we going to get to this water? Obviously, to get to the uh, surface water is easy. We just jump in it, swim in it, bucket it out, pipe it out. But how are we going to get to these other aquifers, the other underground water. The way, the way we're going to get to these is we're going to have to put some wells in, right? So I'm going to put these in green and I'm just going to show these as a little house because, um, you know, it's like a well house. And if we drill a hole and put a pipe in there, obviously that pipe's not long enough. There, we've just hit the water. So I can pull water out of that well, um, out of that pipe, except is that a very good place for the pipe? Remember, this water table can go up and down. And so if that water table went down at all, my, my, my bell would be dry. So we're going to probably want to make it go a little bit further. That's a pretty good well. So I can pump water out of that. And it might be polluted, but it's probably pretty clean. So we're going to call this an active well, right? And that's draining the unconfined aquifer, right? Um, I can put another well here. Because, you know, where I lived, if you live out in the country and you're not on city water, then um, everybody has their own well. And so this person's got a well, this person's got a well. Hey, no problem, right? Except if this person starts pulling out a lot of water, um, what's going to happen? Now, I'm going to try to explain this uh, in a way that you understand. If you were trying to dig a hole, if you were in a swing pool and you took a bucket and you were trying to make a hole in the water, could you make a hole in the water? Of course not. Because as soon as you take a bucket of water out, that bucket, uh, another water just fills in the hole. Um, if you do this at the beach, it takes a little while. Because water, it takes a while for water to move through the sand. So when you're pulling a lot of water out of here, you're going to get the water table is going to drop down like this because as you're pulling the water out, it's going to take, a, it's, it's sucking all the water out of here and it's going to take a while for that water to come back in. In the meantime, look what happened to this person's well. Okay, this well is now a dry well, right? That's no good. And we call this right here, we call this thing right here the zone of... Depression, the zone of depression. This guy's depressed. He's in the zone of depression. Actually, I forget if it's the cone of compression of depression or the zone of depression. Either one. I think it's called a cone, actually. But look, we can just change it to cone. So we've got our cone of depression. That's 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 a consequence of pulling water too fast. Um, and it's okay for this person, um, but it's not okay for this person. Actually, there's only a, there's a certain rate at which you can pull water. You can only pull water out of this so fast 
pretty soon that zone of depression is going to catch up and you're going to go dry as well. Okay, we can also, let's say we're way up here. Um, let's put ourselves way up here. How are we going to get water from here? Well, we can go down into the confined aquifer, right? That's, that's fine too. Um, or we might go all the way down to the very old aquifer. Okay. Let's put one more well right here. Now they always want us to learn about these things and I think it's kind of funny. Um, this well right here is a special kind of well because let's say this is all filled up with water. This is all filled up with water and the water is all the way up to here. Okay, that's the water table, right? The water table is here. Notice that the water table is higher than this well. What's going to happen if you poke a hole through here? This, this water is pushing down. It's actually going to push the water up and out of this well without pumping it. So we call this an artesian well. That's a well where you don't even have to pump the water. You got to put a valve on it because the water table of this confined aquifer, it's got to be a confined aquifer, um, is going to push the water straight out. So another thing about these wells, and I'll make an analogy. Um, which of these wells would you want to use? Well, think about how much water can you pull out of these wells sustainably, right? Sustainable means you can pull it out indefinitely. So there's water coming into these aquifers and, there, and if you're pulling it out, you can only pull water out as fast as it's coming in. And the problem is, is since everyone's using this unconfined aquifer, the more wells that come in here, maybe we're gonna pull the water out faster than it's going in. And that means the water table is gonna go down. And we're gonna talk about that later too. And that's no good. A lot of our unconfined aquifers are not being recharged fast enough and the water level goes down. What people do then is they go to the confined aquifer. But we know the confined aquifer has a smaller recharge zone so that you can overdraft your, your confined aquifer just as easily or actually even more easily. So people tap even further down and they're going into this very old aquifer. Now these old aquifers have got a lot of water in them so people think, oh, that's no problem. But remember, how much water is going into these old aquifers? None. So you can't ever take water out of here sustainably. And this is the analogy. So if your grandfather gives you $10,000 as a one-time thing, he died and he bequeathed that to you, so now you've got $10,000. If you spend it, that's fine, but you're not gonna get any back. You're not, it's not like a paycheck where, where you know, uh, if, if you know, you got money coming in and you got money coming out and hopefully if you're responsible, you're only taking in as much, you're only spending as much as you're receiving. Hopefully you're even saving some, right? Over here, you can't possibly, you know, if you spend any of grandpa's money, um, that's not sustainable. Doesn't mean we can't spend it, but we spend it on special things. So this water here, we should only tap in emergencies. That's like grandpa's money down here. Okay, the last thing we're going to add to this diagram, we even have a little bit more, was we're going to add some more human things to this, to this, um, this thing. So, um, how do, what do we have to do with all this? Well, there's a few things that we're going to add. Um, first of all, when this river floods, that's a problem. We're going to see that people always build in floodplains because it's close to the water, it's nice and flat, and this is the best farming country here because we're going to see that when, the, when it floods, it brings all these nutrients and new soils out here. So people build here. But now we got houses here. We had farms. Now we built houses. So when this floods, we got to do something. So we're going to build levees, which are nothing but dams on both sides of the river. Now remember, the river's going in and out of this page. So this is all along the river, we have these levees. Three E's. Levees. Flood control levees. So when the water... Um, gets high, it doesn't flood and destroy the town, all right? There's problems with that, and we'll talk about that. Um, another thing that we might do is, well, if we gotta try to prevent the water from coming down here, so what can we do? There's no more storage in this lake. If it rains, that's gonna spill right out, go down into a tributary. So we can add a flood control dam, right? This is a flood 
control dam. Okay? What that does is it increases the capacity of that lake. Right? This is increased capacity. We've increased, we've doubled or maybe tripled the capacity of that lake. So as long as we let the water out before the storm, what can happen is when it's storming, any water that would go down into this creek now is going to get stuck behind this flood control dam. And that's going to help prevent flooding. Um, a couple more things we're going to add on this side over here is we like to build things. So we're going to put a parking lot right here. It's just a big square, and I'm going to draw some, um, some lines on it. That's a parking lot. Um, it's cement, it's roads, it's houses, it's anything that's impervious we put on top of the ground. This is impervious surface. Impervious surfaces are going to stop infiltration and increase runoff, right? So they're going to prevent infiltration and increase runoff, impervious surfaces. That's super important. We're going to get to that. The one last thing, something we also do, is we have a tendency of taking out trees. Now remember, trees have lots of roots. These roots, they hold the soil, they all do all sorts of things, but they also take water up out of the ground, right, and transpire it. So if we have fewer trees, we're going to have, um, we're going to have more runoff because uh, also when when um, when it rains on tree roots those roots bust through the ground and water can kind of follow the roots and it helps infiltrate the soil we take those out now we don't have those roots anymore and we don't have the transpiration anymore so we have again more runoff and less transpiration and we're going to see that the transpiration is significant so i know that's a long video but i did that in 22 minutes and normally we take two days to write that down. So that's a lot of stuff in there. And we're going to refer to that in the next few days. Um, if you got questions about that, talk to me in office hours. Um, have a good one.